Okay, so uh, I'm delighted to, uh, to be here. Congratulations to Dennis and IRDG. It's your 25 year anniversary. I think IRDG do a fantastic job in terms of stimulating and orchestrating the whole RD network in Ireland. So, so well done, Dennis and team. I want to talk about um, innovating for adoption and uh, talk about Open Innovation 2.0 as being the new paradigm for, for digital innovation. So I recently joined MasterCard, it's a really great company, it's a, a technology company who happens to be in payments and I work for MasterCard Advisors who perhaps are the world's largest consulting company that you've never heard of. This year MasterCard Advisors will probably get about a billion dollars in consulting uh, revenue. It's got a you know, very large team, lots of ex-Bain, uh, McKinsey, uh, EY, uh, KPMG uh, consultants. So I have more slides than I have minutes, so I'm going to sort of do drive-by shooting, and hopefully at the end, if there are one or two ideas that stick with you, then I'll have uh, been successful. <clears throat> so let's let's start with, you know, potentially we're witnessing the largest change the planet has ever seen. I don't know if you'd agree or disagree with me. But as we think about the future, I wanted to use kind of two, two perspectives. Uh, so we will recognize more here, you know, the, the Fallen of the Bohr Rutherford uh, model of the hydrogen atom. He said prediction is difficult, especially about the future. Then Alan Kay, much less well known, but perhaps in the future will be as well known as Bohr, said the best way to predict the future is to invent it. I like to say the best way to predict the future is, is to innovate it. And as we look forward, we really have to respect the past. But Tim Berners Lee said the future is so much bigger than the past. We actually have to co create this future. We can let this future happen to us or we can actually be a significant part of it. And as we talk about innovation, how might we define innovation? Well, innovation is the creation of something new. Now, it doesn't have to be new, new. It could be something that works in retail for 30 years and moves into healthcare or manufacturing and it's new to the industry or new to a country. There has to be value creation. There's lots of things that are new that actually destruct value. And there has to be an adopter. So, uh, innovation is about new, but not completely new new. It could be a combination of old things that are put together in a new way. There's value created and there's an adopter. What's unique about this time is that in the past, one disruptive technology showed up. It could have been a combustion engine, it could have been electrification, it could be the railways that drove massive change. But now we have multiple disruptive technologies all arriving at the same time. So we're kind of familiar with cloud, but today, a very small company can have a similar compute capability as General Electric or MasterCard or Intel, and you basically buy it as, as you go. So it has really leveled the field, if you think of Porter's Five Forces, in terms of you know new entrants, the barrier to, to this digital world has gone dramatically down. I think we're familiar with mobile and social. We'll talk about the Internet of Things in a second, big data, machine learning is absolutely um, uh, enormous. At MasterCard, we held an event last week. Uh, it's part of a, a corporate program called StartPath, where we're nurturing 10 startup companies, and five of the companies were active in machine learning, artificial intelligence, and some of the things that are happening are, are really cool. A recent Center uh, research showed that 50% of the purchase decisions that we make in five years will be driven by artificial intelligence back end, so it's becoming very real. Uh, people will have heard of block blockchain, distributed ledgers based on peer-to-peer -peer technology, going to dramatically change financial services, going to change dramatically change a lot of other businesses. And then we have the next big thing, uh, and today there's actually many things competing for the next big thing. You've probably seen this image before, this is Pepper, built by Aldebaran in France, acquired by SoftBank, being widely deployed in, in Japanese uh, homes, in, in Japanese restaurants, MasterCard. We're trialing this uh, with, I think it's Pizza Hut, in terms of uh, using it for uh, your menu, uh, communicating your what's the calorie and the fat content of menus. And the NHS have just announced the pilot in the UK where they're going to deploy these devices in, in seniors' homes. So if you add up all of these, it's a perfect storm. And how do you react to the perfect storm? Well, Brian Ling, he says, if the wind blows, you can either build a wall to keep the wind out or you can build some windmills. And I think the choice we have to make is actually build some windmills and actually harness all these disruptive forces. So the Internet of Things will be the largest industry in the history of electronics. 
but that impact would be dwarfed by the impact that it has on virtually every other domain. Moore's Law is providing, I can't think of a domain that isn't being influenced by Moore's Law. And what we've seen, the cost of computing has gone down a factor of 6x in the last 10 years. The cost of communications has gone down a factor of 40x in the last uh, 10 years. Now sensing has come down a factor of 2x. But as we start to see more nanoelectronics come forward, the cost of sensing and actuation, it, while it won't qu quite mirror the dramatic change that we've seen in Moore's Law and you know, communications driven by Gilder's Law, it's really going to open up a huge amount of change and a lot of chaos is going to reign and then the job will be to, to reign in that chaos. Uh, MasterCard actually, I was so surprised to learn, actually quite a leader uh, in the world of the Internet of Things. I was really surprised when I learned around the, the capabilities of a credit card with the ELV technology and it's a technology that was well ahead of its time. So it's something that we're, we hope to exploit in MasterCard. You know, about a decade ago there was a whole concept of occasionally connected computing and the EMV card is a very good example of that. One of MasterCard's core priorities at the moment is rolling out a technology called MasterPass, which is an electronic version of a credit card, which is much more powerful, much more usable. And we're working with a lot of global banks to bring this technology to the market. It's a very good example of the, the Internet of Things enabled by the smart card or by a smartphone. So who's going to have a Kodak moment? Well, many, many companies are going to have a Kodak moment uh, with this new world. I thought this yeah, research was quite stunning from Mark Perry in Michigan. The rate of change in the standard core 500 is absolutely ginormous. So based on current rates of churn, he anticipates that 75% of the standard core 500 will have turned over in the next 10 years, which is amazing. I, I personally think that's a little bit too aggressive because people are going to be smart around technology but there's a huge amount of change happening. And who, who remembers that, you know, people like Kevin Green would have sat in borders before, and, you know, I was using the slide with one of my French team, and he said to me, who's borders? And, you know, if you said that five years ago, everybody would know who, who borders were. So how quick this happens. Um, massive impact in terms of, uh, so this is a, just a simulation for City, one of the world's largest banks. It's based on some data from McKinsey. But their, their net income last year was about 14 and a half billion. If they use um, digital correctly, they could see their net income go up to more than 20 billion. If they miss the boat, uh, they'll be less than 10 billion. And this is a very short space of time. MIT, Capgemini, companies that are operating on the front line of digital are 25 or more than 25% more profitable. At the Innovation Value Institute, we recently done a study of about 130 organizations and um, we looked at what were the top drivers for uh, digital and um, it's very interesting I'll, I'll contrast this data later on with what's happening in financial services but the main drivers were improving operational efficiencies improving customer engagement and enhancing existing products and services so they're actually quite incremental but they're actually very significant if you you know McKinsey estimate uh, benefits 30 percent if you can fix your operational efficiencies uh, using digital so, so what is digital? I try to define uh, innovation. This is the, the definition that we're using at the MasterCard digital practice. So digital is innovation with and the use of information technology to improve human organization and ecosystem performance. Uh, so it's innovation with and use of information and technology to drive human organization and ecosystem performance and ultimately societal performance. And what we're trying to do is leverage the capabilities and the economics of silicon, network, platform, information, knowledge, and so on. So we think Open Innovation 2.0 is a new paradigm. This is something that we've been working at at the Innovation Value Institute with the EU Open Innovation Strategy and Policy Group. Um, there's a new primordial soup happening where we're all completely interconnected and an in innovation. In the future, knowledge was, or in the past, knowledge was power. Now it's a, a commodity. If an innovation happens in Australia, it can be copied almost immediately or imitated in Ireland or, or, or the US. So we're all innovating together. And when we're connected like this, innovation happens at a much faster pace. Lots of very good studies coming out of the Santa Fe Institute saying why are cities much more innovative uh, than other places? And a lot has to do with the rate of the connectivity and the proximity of people. 
Um, so we're starting to see these patterns happen. Uh, so as we look at Open Innovation 2.0, there are very clear patterns that are emerging. And I'm working on a book with Boris Salman from the European Commission, which we hope to publish middle of this year. And we've identified 50 patterns that are emerging in terms of how you do this, how you work in this new open innovation paradigm. We know that innovation uh, is very risky. The average success rate in innovations, according to Dublin, is 6%. But when you try and innovate an ecosystem, when you try and innovate a social change in the global industry, the failure rates are, are much higher. Um, uh, and we recently published a piece in Nature talking about 12 principles for open innovation 2.0. And from that, we're trying to work on a pattern language. And as I said, we hope to publish something middle of this year. Uh, the core practice that we see, or the core pattern that we see uh, to be successful in ecosystem innovation or driving structural change in any industry is the idea of shared purpose. So we look at shared vision, we look at shared value, we look at shareholder value, of course that's important, but it goes beyond that, it goes stakeholder value. Who are all the stakeholders in the ecosystem? We look at shared value at risk because very often you're trying to innovate to protect something rather than to augment it. And then lastly, shared values. It's hugely important if you're in an ecosystem or an industry and you're trying to innovate that people have shared values. I just want to give one example. You know, the best example of a shared vision is probably John F. Kennedy's idea. We'll put a man on the moon and we'll bring him back safely this decade. And there's the famous story of the janitor at one of the NASA facilities who was asked, well, what's your job? And he said, well, I'm working to put a man on the moon. Michael Porter, uh, has done a lot about the idea of shared value. I know the health summit is on here in parallel, and he's put forward some great ideas around how healthcare can be fixed by just aligning financial incentives and patient outcomes. And we'll come back to this um, example with JFK later in the presentation. But what I'll say, the unit of competition has changed. Uh, the Intel guys can't uh, answer this, but does anyone know who this picture is of? It's a very young looking Gordon Moore who wrote a famous paper in 1965 called You're Cramming More Integrated, or Transistors Onto Integrated Circuits. And uh, I remember the first meeting where I joined Intel as an extended executive staff. I was in UB, it was in California in 2000. Mark Andreessen was our keynote speaker. You know, he had founded Mosaic. But Gordon Moore was also chairman, and I just picked up my brown bag lunch and I sat down, and Gordon Moore wandered over to me and sat beside me, and we had a really pleasant chat. Great philanthropist, you know, great technologist, great engineer, but a very, very humble person. But the implication of Moore's law is far, far, far more profound than what happens just in, on the integrated circuit. Uh, what he has enabled and what Intel and the semiconductor has enabled is that the unit of competition has changed from, it's not about the organization, how good MasterCard is, or how good IRDG is, or how good Manusium versus how good is our ecosystem. It's no longer about the product. It's about the platform. The platform is it. If you lose the platform, you're finished. And what I propose is that Open Innovation 2.0 is a new paradigm for digital. Digital enables Open Innovation 2.0, and Open Innovation 2.0 creates an awful lot of digital assets. So it's a virtuous circle. And if you get into that virtuous circle, it's unstoppable. If you fall off it, it's almost impossible to get back on it. So what keeps MasterCard awake? What keeps Intel awake? What keeps Siemens awake? This is a Siemens slide. Uh, so instead of being reactive and waiting for somebody to come along and eat your lunch, you actually have to get out there and orchestrate the ecosystem. And, and uh, last week uh, at the CHQ building at MasterCard, we had our start, start path meeting where we've selected 10 really hot uh, startups and we're working with them to provide technology to them to nurture them and hopefully they become part of our ecosystem. And it's all about cash, cachet, and capacity, extending, you know, expanding our ecosystem. So I want to talk about three important patterns that are you know, hugely important. Uh, the idea of a pattern, platforms, and practice. And so this wisdom is very old. Seneca, the younger, it's kind of a little, little play. He was around from the time of Jesus Christ. But he said, the way is long if one follows precepts or rules. The way is short if one follows patterns. So if you're trying to innovate in this very fast moving world, you can't do step paint by numbers. You have to find the patterns and, and move with them. The way I would define a pattern or design, patterns are generally reasonable solutions to commonly occurring problems. Now you need a little bit of luck if you're going to be successful in this new world because it's moving so fast. But Seneca also said something, look at what happens when preparation meets opportunity or challenge. Now I want to show a quick video 
Uh, it's four minutes long, but look out for the, you know, the idea of pattern, platform, November 14, 1960. So if we could cue the video, please. If you click on, click on SCA Talks. November 14, 1969, Apollo 12. Astronauts Pete Conrad, Dick Gordon, and... So this is the digital world at work, you know, it's point and click. Any luck, Declan? We did test this before. This is a really compelling piece of video. 1969, Apollo 12. Astronauts Pete Conrad, Dick Gordon, and Alan Bean are headed for the second moon landing. The need to make a fast decision is about to fall on controller John Aaron. He's in charge of electrical and environmental systems. His call sign, ECOM. The thing that makes a good ECOM is a natural curiosity about how things work, even if you don't are not responsible for them. Apollo 12 lifts off. It's Jerry Griffin's first launch as flight director. And all of a sudden everything, all the data went away, and there was a big static in the headset. I said, Egon, what do you see? I looked down at all my uh, telemetry data, the readouts from the spacecraft, and they were nonsensical. In the spacecraft, astronaut Alan Bean has no clue either. Lights pop on, and the alarm system comes on. More lights than I'd ever seen ever in the simulator. I mean, there was main bus A, main bus B. It's an electrical failure. The command module has lost main power. Emergency batteries take over, but they'll only last two hours. Mission Control is facing a launch abort. Jettison the spacecraft and blow up the Saturn V. Now John Aaron's curiosity pays off. A year earlier, during a test, he had seen a strange pattern of data and had learned about an obscure switch inside the command module that could fix it. I had seen that pattern before, and it had been one year since I had seen it. But it was like that pattern was written in my mind. The Saturn V's engines keep burning, but the command module on top of the rocket is barely alive, powered only by emergency batteries. Everyone expects ECOM to abort. Then Aaron makes a different call. I said, Flight, tell them to take the SCE to Ox. And I said, What? SCE to Ox. I said, What's that? It was some obscure switch, signal condition electronics to auxiliary. I turned to the Capcom and I, Jerry Carr and I said, and Carson, what? <laughs> Mission Control comes back and says, Turned out Al Bean knew where that switch was. It was back over his shoulder. He threw the switch and we got all of our data back and we could see what the problem was. Later analysis reveals Apollo 12 had been hit by lightning, which traveled down the rocket's exhaust to the ground, knocking the spacecraft's main electrical system offline. The obscure SCE switch wasn't designed for this situation, but it works. Thank God for mission control. Thank God for mission control. I didn't have any idea what to do. Pete Conrad broke out in nervous laughter. 
he laughed all the way into work. Okay, I think it's a really compelling piece of video, but I think it's actually the story of what's going on in terms of our digital world. It's the equivalent of a space race. Uh, Declan, if we can go back to the slide. So, uh, you heard Al Bean say, we've lost the platform. If you lose your platform, you're, you're finished. And if you don't win the race to the platform, it, it's end of story. In this case, it, it could have had you know, terrible consequences uh, for the astronauts. Very quick thinking. They did a huge amount of sort of practice beforehand and simulations. I can't believe how cool they were um, you know, in the, in the capsule when that happened. Um, Neil Armstrong was here in Dublin many years ago and Gabe Byrne interviewed him, he was a very private person, but Gabe Byrne asked him, I think it was at the National Concert Hall, he said, well, Neil, what were your thoughts, you know, when you lifted off and you were starting to look down on the, the earth and so, you know what he said? Uh-oh. So that was his, uh, you know, reaction. Those guys were so cool. So it's about practicing many times, but it's also about practice, practice of innovation and digital. We certainly believe at MasterCard that innovation in digital is something that can be managed as a practice and can be a lot more predictable. And it's all about patterns, recognizing those patterns. Those initially you're going to see these weak merging signals. And can you actually distinguish that this is a pattern? Now, once you've figured that out, what are the patterns for replication? Because innovation is all about uh, creation, but it's a lot more about imitation. So having these patterns where you can replicate innovation. So I want to finish by talking about innovating for adoption. Michael Schwey says, innovation is not innovators innovating. It's, excuse me, it's customers adopting. And most of our efforts and money are spent in innovation creation, but all the value comes from adoption. This is very obvious, but you know, takes the OECD to come up with a statement like this. Trying to give innovation value comes from creation, 80% from adoption. So which of these would you buy? This is the Intel device, this is the iPhone. Intel shut down our MP3 factory two weeks before Apple launched the iPod. We were in the this business two, two years before Apple, so why were they successful and Intel not? Well, a lot has to do with courage, a lot has to do uh, with Having taken an ecosystem view at, at, at Intel, it wasn't seen as strategic. Um, Niall O'Connor, he's the Apple CIO. We invited him at the IBI to come over and talk about five or six years ago. We gave him the Leader in IT Value Award. And he talked about the phone call he received from Steve Jobs. And literally said, he picked up the phone in his office and he, you know, he heard Steve say, Hi Niall, this is Steve. Come down to my office. We're going into the music industry. And Apple just made a decision, you know, we're going for it. Uh, so we'll come back to this, but Apple marketed this, this was 10,000 songs in your pocket. pocket. You know, the Intel marketing was, well, it's 128 megabytes of built-in memory and other stuff. So, so which would you buy? But here's the pattern for innovation adoption. And as I mentioned, we're working out, you know, we've about 50 patterns that we see, but for something to be adopted, it's got to have utility. It's got to um, use, there's got to be users. There has to be user experience. It's got to be usable, and in this new digital world, it's got to be ubiquitous. What we're seeing is more and more big bang disruption. So um, stuff um, like Xbox or um, uh, what's the the uh, you know Microsoft uh, Visual? You, you, I think you know what I'm talking about. That, but that basically went up like that, and then like, they will come to you in a second. Uh, but if you think about utility, people only use stuff if, if it's useful. Um, so the Swiss Army knife is very useful, but the smartphone. That basically is the digital equivalent of the Swiss Army knife. You can use it for a gyroscope, a DB meter, it's your personal email. It's the most incredible platform I think the world has ever seen. If we think about users, um, Everett Rogers talk, you know, drew this curve many years ago, and then other people, Jeffrey Moore, talked about you know, crossing the chasm. Uh, but you have to find the early users, the early, the early innovators. Well, quite a staggering statistic, and I think Intel has forgotten this, so it's 70% of significant innovations in the semiconductor industry in the last 30 years came from lead users. Intel basically grew on an innovation that was inspired by a user. Uh, Intel was trying to sell a, a um, product to Busycon in Japan. It required 10 discrete integrated circuits and Ted Hoff came up with the idea, well, we can put this into a single piece of silicon. Intel sold the product to Busycon and then realized a few weeks later, gosh, we just sold something valuable and then Intel had to buy it back for 10 times 
uh, what they sold the, the um, rights to Busycom. Very important, the users are hugely important. Jean-Claude Bernal went through this slide actually 10 years ago about the role of the user changing from being a research object to a contributor, and then the user as an innovator. And in the Open Innovation 2.0 patterns, we see the idea of reverse innovation paradigm, where the whole ecosystem is driven by I mean, Apple aren't just successful because they have great products, but the momentum of their ecosystem is driven, driven by the users. So the, you know, the app industry, and this is actually quite an old slide, it was non-existent 15 years ago, and now it's an enormous industry, delivered, you know, um, basically enabled by hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of small developers, small companies working together. Facebook, it's all about the API. Over 9 million apps are built on top of Facebook, and you get this virtuous circle going on. Facebook bring more and more users to these app developers, and they keep developing. So as we look forward, actually, the scaling engine, if we're thinking about adoption, APIs are going to be the scaling engine um, of this new digital world. Yeah, I had the you know, pleasure of hearing Mark Andreessen talk back in 2000 that he famously said software is eating the world. But as you're thinking about your business and making these APIs available, there's some patterns that you need to, they have to be easy to access, they have to be designed for a great user experience, both in terms of the developer using it and then what they enable in the marketplace. They have to be optimized for the use case, something that might work in healthcare may not work in retail. They have to be simple and modular, and you have to build and orchestrate a community that inspire a community. And APIs essentially will be the digital Lego building blocks of the, of the new economy. You, of course, have to design things for use. Uh, when I was at Intel, we built an end-to-end uh, -end IoT platform, and we tested these devices in real-world world environments. Here are some of the um, examples of devices that we tested in Dublin, and we learned, for example, there isn't enough solar power uh, to you know, run these devices you know, from November to our sunlight to power these devices. So we would see in March these devices starting to wake up, Whereas these devices in Santander, where they originally tested, they ran throughout the year. We found that actually these devices were blown off uh, lampposts uh, through the Dublin storms. This is a picture I took in Enfield, and we actually learned something that the device we were deploying was even far more capable than the device that was in the field. In the top right hand corner, you'll see our prototype uh, IoT gateway and air, you know, air monitoring uh, station that we built. But when we deployed it in the field, this is what Enfield were using for air quality monitoring, but it actually wasn't connected to the internet. So we were bringing a very capable device into the marketplace, way smaller, uh, similar efficiency, way cheaper. And we found, actually we learned by just going into the field, actually the differentiation was even better than, than we had thought. And we would never discover that if we just did this testing in the lab. So designing for use is very important. Um, I probably don't need to say anything about this slide. We are in the experience economy. It's all about the user experience. And I remember driving down the you know one on one in California, and you would be you know bombasted by images like this, you know, from Apple advertising the iPod, and they created a whole new user experience. So if you don't have the user experience, and the reason why the smartphone is adopted because it had a much better user experience. You know, the Nokia phones that would run for a week or two weeks without charge. People were willing to accept, well, I have to charge my phone every day, but I'll have a much better experience. And then usability. The devices have to be usable. I, I could give you 10 examples of this. This is uh, Samsung make you know, great products, but their servers went down and most of the functionality couldn't be used. Um, there was a new um, high definition TV launched about four weeks ago. Can't remember who the manufacturer is, but it was never, obviously never tested in a living room because when I spoke beside a Wi-Fi router, the screen got totally corrupted. I was never discovered as a product that was launched worldwide, so it was really never tested for, for usability. So the importance of putting devices into the field and testing them where they want to be used is really important. And then usability. The iPad, it can be used by a baby, it can be used by an, an elder. So these are things that Apple have thought about and have got right. And one of the things we've been working on in the MasterCard digital practice is actually assessing you know, how likely is something going to be successfully uh, adopted. And this is actually a real example where the elder ring was actually the incumbent solution and somebody was proposing a disruptive solution which was really outstanding on one feature 
But once, you, once it was measured up around what it was trying to displace, it's going to take about three years for this product to get anywhere near the existing capability, so it likely won't be adopted. So you can save yourself a lot of money if you do an assessment like this. So last couple of slides, it's not just about adoption, but it's about um, adaption. So what's adaption? It's a form, function, or structure modified to fit a different environment. So I have a, you know, a, a $6 million question for you. So did Apple or governments create the iPhone? Does anyone know the answer? Well, actually both. So if you look at the, why is the iPhone so smart? And the original iPod, CERN, DARPA, Department of Defense, all of the components actually were developed and funded by government research. And what Apple did was an amazing synthesis job to put it together and drove an incremental improvement. So just to finish, it's not just about adoption, but actually adaption is, is hugely important. And the future of digital innovation is about taking smart combinations or intelligent combinations of new existing and emerging technologies to deliver great solutions. Last two slides. At IVI, we've been working on a digital business readiness index. MasterCard and IVI are partnering together. We've recently done a survey of um, a bunch of financial institutions, and you'll be surprised that 70% of these financial institutions, these are world names, don't have a comprehensive digital strategy. Even more, 77% of customers for IT is the limiter for agility. And people will be familiar with the IT capability maturity framework very unique insights provided by that. There's always fires in IT, and this can really help figure out actually what are the things that you need to, to fix. So to summary, you know, the opportunities are limitless and priceless. Thanks for listening.